Prashant Palviya. I'm the director of the McDowell Research Center for Global IT Management. I welcome you all to the third lecture in our lecture series uh, uh, to be given by uh, Robert or Bob McDowell, Vice President Information Worker Business Value at Microsoft Corporation. Uh, before I introduce him, I'd like to take this opportunity to tell you a little bit about the McDowell Research Center. Uh, now completing almost two years, the MRC McDowell Research Center was established in October 2007 by a generous gift from Bob and Lisa McDowell, his wife, who is an alumna of UNCG. Uh, at the same time, we also formed an advisory board made up of senior executives from various companies and hospitals which guide the mission and the work of the MRC. Uh, we just had a meeting this morning of the board and Bob McDowell chairs this board. Our stated mission and objectives of the McDowell Research Center are the following. Number one, in recognition of the escalating healthcare costs in the U.S. and the role of information technology, our primary mission is research and IT in healthcare. Uh, the McDowell Research Center is dedicated to the study of adoption, implementation, and management challenges in utilizing information technology in healthcare. And number two, the MRC will continue to examine global <coughs> issues in IT management. Uh, current topics include return on, return on IT investment, outsourcing, and privacy and security. Number three, the MRC will offer programs for both profit and non-profit organizations at regional uh, national and international levels. If any of you are interested in the work of the MRC, I invite you to contact me in, in my office and we can discuss and explore uh, potential opportunities. Uh, now that was a brief introduction to the center and again, like I said, we can talk uh, more if you, if you need to. Now for the main event for which you're all waiting for, it is my pleasure to introduce Bob McDowell and I'll go through a rundown, it's a long resume, I tried to cut it down, but it's still taking me a few minutes going through it. Who has more than 40 years of experience in the IT industry and is focused on identifying critical business problems that can be solved through the application of Microsoft technologies. Uh, Bob joined Microsoft in 1990 to establish Microsoft Consulting Services and grew that organization to more than 1,200 people in more than 40 countries. In 1995, he became Vice President of the Enterprise Customer Unit at Microsoft. From 1996 to 2000, he served as Vice President for, Inter for Enterprise Business Relationships, working with many of Microsoft's strategic large enterprise customers. And in 2000, he became Vice President of Worldwide Services for both consulting and product support. In 2002, uh, he took on his current role in the, work, in the information worker group to help customers maximize their use of current uh, Microsoft Office technologies in ways that significantly add business value to their organizations. Uh, before joining Microsoft, uh, Bob spent seven years as a partner with Ernst & Young, seven years in the financial services industry, and eight years in the Department of Defense. Uh, Bob is the author of several articles on the impact of information technology on business and has been quoted in many business and technology uh, publications including the Fortune Magazine, Information Week, and Computer World. He is the author of the book uh, Driving Digital and the book In Search of Business Value, Ensuring a Return on Your Technology Investment. Uh, he serves on the boards of several organizations including Visio Corp and Tivo Corporation, Virginia Military Institute Foundation, Virginia Commission on Information Techn Technology, and the Scottish Enterprise. 
He holds a bachelor's degree in economics from Virginia Military Institute and a master of science degree in business administration from Boston University. And he lectures extensively in professional association meetings, universities, and conference around the world. Now, this is what came from his, uh, from his write-up and the formal uh, resume that he had. Uh, on a personal note, I met Bob about uh, two years ago. Uh, and I was impressed by his knowledge of the issues and the focus on pragmatism and practical value. Before and during and after and all throughout, he provide, provided funding for the center. His emphasis has always been on the value or the return on investment uh, IT can provide for the organization. And that has actually become our mantra in, as well as in the center. In the meeting we had this uh, morning, he kept repeating, and the board members as well, about uh, the value concept uh, as we take work in the center. Uh, usefulness uh, or practical value is therefore a key, key criteria of all the research in the, that the MRC undertakes. Uh, he is a very knowledgeable, dynamic, and also an entertaining speaker, as you're all going to find out. Uh, finally, Bob has a very sharp judgment. Uh, one example of that is his funding of the McDowell Research Center. <laughs> well, I have to thank Prashant for that very kind uh, introduction. You will note his emphasis of the 40 years. Thing. Um, it's been an amazing experience to uh, have spent essentially all of my adult life in the information technology profession. It's been through good luck and, and good fortune. And I am passionate about the idea that as a profession, as an industry, we have the best potential we've ever had for making a significant difference in the world, a quality of people's lives, both at home and at work, we've ever had. And what I'm going to spend my time talking to you about today is this issue of how to get that value out of technology investments. Because I think the major issues that are holding it up have very little to do with technology failing to work properly. It has to do with a whole lot of other things that are actually much tougher to deal with than technology issues. In fact, when I entered this room, uh, it suddenly occurred to me I'd been here once before. And I won't forget that. Uh, in fact, the gentleman that welcomed me in the room didn't know something I knew about this room. That behind that screen there is actually an escape door. <laughs> you might wonder why I knew that so well. You see, several years ago, I was asked to lecture at my beloved wife of 41 years and a graduate of UNCG on a topic that I was very passionate about at the time. Why don't we rethink why professors have tenure? I crowded the seating. There were differing opinions than mine. I'm still convinced that's a question that should be asked because it's an example of things we should consider changing if you're going to truly get value out of information technology. What I thought I would do is talk just a little bit about Microsoft itself, because I think many of you might be interested in not a product pitch. In fact, I come bearing gifts today. I hope you've already noticed that. That's right. You'll hear someone from Microsoft speak to you for an hour or so without the use of one PowerPoint slide. <laughs> I have yet to fail, as often I'm presenting before customers, and they're out at Microsoft visiting, and they've been with us two or three days. So these meetings are one after another after another, and I'll come in over the schmooze lunch or something and say that to them. It got so emotional that about uh, six months ago, I've forgotten our guests, uh, company's name, but they had been there. I had them for lunch on their third day. When I said that, there was a silent moment. Then they all looked at each other, stood up in unison, gave me a standing ovation, 
and two or three of them broke out with tears of joy. So that is, it's a little bit of overuse of technology. But I'm going to talk really about the company from the perspective of looking at the industry in a broader way. I've been with Microsoft for 20 years, and it still takes my breath away how much has changed in 20 years, which frankly is not that long a time. But I'm going to take it from the perspective of the implications of that in terms of where we're going as a technology industry. And you almost haven't seen anything yet. Then I'm going to focus on the issue of business value. Why is this the issue now? Why do I think it is so compelling that I stand before political institutions, education institutions, businesses, and directly tell them that I believe it's financially irresponsible of them not to implement some of this technology faster than they are. And a failure to do so is not technology failing, but a failure of leadership. And I'm going to back it up. Then I'm going to talk about why not before. Why wasn't this such a big deal in our industry before? And I'm going to be fairly blunt as to why. Then I'm going to take just a sampling of what I think I learned out of that second book that Prashant talked about. That was an effort to speak only to chief executive officers, CEOs, CIOs, and chief financial officers. And the sample set covered everything from the United States Army, some people might not realize this, not enough of our own employees understand this. I happen to believe that any employee of any company on earth ought to know right off the top of their tongue what their biggest customer is. Too many people think for Microsoft it's toys and games and cute stuff. Our biggest customer is the United States Army. The United States Army. The one contract with the United States Army is $780 million. This is betting the farm stuff on software. That pays the rent. I'm going to talk about what I think the critical issues are. And by the way, the Army, and I also introduced uh, or interviewed a company here in North Carolina called East Industries. They employ all of 27 people. Their high-tech business, building wooden pallets. I love capitalism. I don't care about the current discussion. I love it. I love entrepreneurs. The ways you can make money, it's just unlimited. And I never thought about wooden pallets. That's an exciting opportunity. You know, there's like, there's wooden pallets, you make them, and you sell them and rent them, and then stuff that's too heavy gets put on them, and the wooden pallets break, and then there's a wooden pallet repair operation, there's an annual wooden pallet conference, there are wooden pallet working committees. Amazing stuff. And how is technology impacting that kind of organization? And Mary Kay Cosmetics and a banking industry, Lloyds Bank in the UK, it touches everything. And what I was looking for was trying to understand from that level, were they seeing value from technology, and more importantly to me, what did they think the biggest impediments were? And I'll share with you what I think there was strong consensus around the top three were. And then I'm going to close by trying to give you an idea of why I believe this is the most important time, the biggest opportunity our profession, the technology, information technology profession has to make a giant difference in the quality of individual lives, our society, the world. And I'm going to give you a little hint about what we're, as a company, doing about that. Because as bad as this economy is, and who now knows how long it's going to last, it is an unbelievable opportunity for businesses that get it. And, the one, and there, this will end. No one knows when. But I'm telling you what, the companies that make the right investments now don't throttle back on silly costs, even look at this as an investment opportunity, are going to come out the other end stronger and more competitive. Time will judge which companies those are and which ones they are. Maybe a way to kind of look at the Microsoft picture for the last 20 years, I'll give you just a quick sample set of the company I joined. 
in late 1989 in the company I'm with today. And also kind of a couple of personal pieces of that story that you might get a kick out of. I had been a partner with Ernst & Young for a number of years, and because I entered the military during Vietnam, um, uh, graduated from VMI, took a commission, went in the Air Force, how on earth did I end up in the technology business? In 1968, there were no more than three colleges in America with a major in computer science. I was an economics graduate, but happily the head of that department believed even then computers would be important, so I took a course, leading edge course, you were required to complete it to graduate, in Fortran programming. There's leading edge stuff, right? Yes, I, I walked to the computer science building, or the physics building, I guess where they had this course, with the decks full of cards, and if you drop the decks, they were all over the place, and you started over. I do a lot of speaking internally for our company as well as externally, and I often am asked to speak to new employee groups. You want to age yourself. Uh, get before a group of fresh computer science graduates right out of the best colleges on earth. Just joined Microsoft and I'm talking about the history of the profession industry and I introduced them to a concept called a slide rule. Now at VMI when I marched off to calculus class as a rat, that's what freshmen of course are referred to as, uh, I had appropriately in a military manner a leather case strapped to my belt and in there was a slide rule and that's what I went to calculus class. Have you ever tried to explain, well you wouldn't of course in this audience I wouldn't think, but imagine explaining a slide rule to a 22 year old computer science graduate who grew up with computers from his or her birth. So let's see, what I did was I had this thing and it's three sticks and the top stick and the bottom stick were bolted together and I slid the third stick in the middle back and forth and that's how I got through calculus class. People are looking at you like you arrived from another planet. It wasn't that long ago. That's how fast this is happening. And when I joined in 1989, Microsoft, already in business for a while, it was officially formed in 1975, Bill and 12 other employees, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Early 80s moves up to the Bellevue, Seattle, Washington area, the, public, the company goes public in 1985. In 1989, that fiscal year, Microsoft generated $804 million on Earth. Worldwide revenues. Do you know what war, worldwide revenues meant in 1989? It meant the United States of America. Canada, New Zealand, Australia, a new business in Japan, a new business in Mexico, <coughs> Europe, right. The United Kingdom, Italy, Germany, and France. Worldwide revenues, $804 million. What do we sell? Word. Good product, but it didn't lead in this market segment. Something called WordPerfect did. Excel, good product, didn't lead in its market segment. Something called Lotus 123 did. PowerPoint? Nope. Couldn't wow the world with the joys of that technology. We hadn't bought the company that helped us build it yet. What was the leading edge graphics presentation tool at the time? Most of you wouldn't even know. It's called Harvard Business Graphics. It's long gone. We had the clearest database strategy we'd ever had. It was non-existent. We tried to build one, it never got to market, thank heaven. The networking strategy was based around something called Land Manager. Probably never heard of it. It was our first attempt at local area networking. And the rock solid, stable, and secure operating system at the time was something called Windows 2.0. Something based on a little technology called DOS which no CIO in his or her right mind would allow in their data center, wisely. But it was a company that had figured out the business model, but realized that it wouldn't carry them to where they wanted to go. The business model was high volume, low cost, and become a de facto standard. But with that technology set, you couldn't get into the big upside, business and government. So they hired another fella about my age, who's still with the company too, and for those of you who would study the computer industry, he is infamous. He was given the same privilege I was. Any business person wants to do a startup. That's what Microsoft gave me a shot at. A service business 
from the beginning, all you got is a blank sheet of paper and you. There is no thrill to match it. In his case, he was an operating system developer. And Dave Cutler is his name. And Dave Cutler is the father of something called VMS, which is an operating system a company called Digital Equipment Corporation used to be very successful in selling a hardware line called the VAX. Some of you might not be aware of that either, because it's long gone. That company at its peak employed 185,000 people. It was the fastest growing company in the industry in taking market share from IBM. I would repeat, it is long gone. There is not a computer company that I worked with as a technology implementation project in that financial institution I was with that's still here. Names like Prime, Data General, Wang, Digital Equipment Corporation, Data Point. Many of the multi-billion dollar businesses even then, they are all gone. Every single one of them. Part of my passion around pragmatism, I guess, and a short fuse around getting something done, is our industry is unforgiving. There is absolutely no guarantee here. In the history of a leader in one era of computing, leading in the next is not a real strong story. In fact, when a fellow named Tom Watson, then making typewriters and adding machines for a little company called IBM, saw the first computer in the mid-1940s. We're not that old a profession, right? That was the first. He looked at the situation, saw what he was doing at the time, and he made the statement publicly that he believed the Earth would probably need four or five of those. And Ken Olson, a brilliant man, his late 70s, I've had the privilege of meeting him a couple of times, and the leader in the so-called mini-computer era, taking that share from IBM I was talking about on a rocket ride and he saw the first few personal computers, he said. I can't imagine why anyone would want one of those in their home. And that company's not here. One of the reasons I believe so passionately that Microsoft may be able to break that mold is that I'm proud that our founder, current chairman of the company, was one of the first to say, the PC era is over. <laughs> now, that doesn't mean there are no PCs, or that there are no mini computers, or the no mainframes. It means that for the industry, it is no longer the prime platform that we are building new technology for. Because today it's about network computing. It's about mobile device on any time, anywhere, any place. And that's a very different world than a device that sits on your desktop. And so, why hire someone like me? It's because Cutler was brought in to build this operating system that would be credible to business and government, and a belief that you would need someone to have a service organization to serve them. If you fast forward to today, look at the company I'm with now. We had, when I joined, about 2,800 employees. We currently have about 95,000 full-time employees. I don't even know what the part-time count is. And our revenues have improved a little bit. We've gone from 804 million to 65 billion. Um, I go through an annual review, just like everyone else in the company, and I've tried to point out several times to, to Bill and Steve and others the direct relationship in that revenue growth and my time with the company. I've never received the full bonus that I felt I deserved there, probably because it's a whole lot of people had something to do with that. And what do we sell today? We sell Office, which has about 95% market share, which is not too bad. We sell an operating system, a real database product that's so credible that our largest customer on Earth is the United States Army. And its second largest customer, by the way, is the United Kingdom's National Health Service. It's big business and big government. And if you look at our business today, there are three pieces. There's the group that I'm in that builds things like SharePoint and Exchange and Office and the rest that the user sees. There's a group that builds the platform, the operating system, the database, the development tools. And there's a third one that we're still investing in, but making some progress, and that's, of course, consumer. That's online services, that's games, that's Xbox, and the rest of it. Our mission statement says apply software wherever it can be of value, we aspire to be 
the best software company on earth. And the final data point for all of you to think about, and the country of the United States to think about, as we have this emotional political debate about, you know, jobs for Americans, for America, the taint, protectionism, which is the worst thing that could happen to us in the world. I always enjoy speaking often to adult audiences that aren't in our industry and tell them the story I just told you and then say, 65 billion in worldwide revenue, do you know what that means today? We're our fastest growing markets. Detroit, Los Angeles, New York City, good markets. It's South America, it's Brazil, it's Mexico, it's Argentina, it's the Far East. Imagine, I remember my father telling me the story of the feeling he had when he went to Germany for the first time, about 25 years after he'd gotten out of uniform, flying in a bomber, bombing the enemy, Germany. Imagine how I felt literally almost 25 years after I got out of EMI and put on the uniform of my country and met with the IRS of the country of Vietnam to sell them software. I think that's a positive story and something maybe humans should think about a little bit. The world does change. And so when I say 65 billion in worldwide revenue, listen to what I say here. Yes, the US is a great, important, important market. But today, not in the future sometime, not in the planning process 10 years out, today, when you add up what we collect, the money we collect for stuff we build, the software people pay us for, and it varies depending on the exchange rate. But today, 65 to 70% of our revenue comes from outside the United States. Today. And it's growing. What's the biggest revenue drain for a software company? It's piracy. It's people who use it and don't pay us for it. That problem is bigger in developing countries. As they develop, get mature legal infrastructure, that gets better. So the piracy rate in some parts of the Far East can run in the 80% range, used to run the 90% range. That high, they don't pay us for it. Imagine what that percentage would be if they paid us for all the software they use. And over time they will. That is business today. It is a global economy, whether you like it or not. I happen to think it's a great thing, and I'd rather be battling with countries economically than I would be shooting at them. And maybe it'll even bring us a little bit closer together. So given that environment, why is this value issue the issue? It's because our profession, our industry, Microsoft included, has done an interesting job in developing a value proposition that people have historically bought. There was an era in computing in the 70s and 80s that was called the office automation era. Most of you probably heard that term. Office automation. The early days of word processing and spreadsheets. I used to speak at the annual OAC, the Office Automation Conference. The last one was held in 1983. What was the value proposition of office automation? It was the paperless office. The paperless office. Well, we delivered on that. <laughs> Happily, someone once told me that a paperless office would be about as useful as a paperless bathroom, so maybe it wasn't that important to be there. But what, in retrospect, a silly value proposition. And then, as we move closer to this time, the argument for technology was productivity increases. Most employees figured this out pretty quickly. Let's do a productivity study and see how many slots we can cut. That was motivational for people to want to sign up and get involved. And then there would be massive productivity studies done by consulting firms and technology departments and companies like ours. And you do these massive studies and calculations and you determine that if you install this technology, the average productivity increase per employee would be 8.92%. Then how do we create a value proposition that people understand and quantify in a proper way? You know what basically happened? You take 8.2%, you multiply that times the pay grade of the employee, you multiply that times the number of employees, times the value of their benefits package, maybe the air they breathe, the parking lot, whatever it takes to get a payback in six months or less. Smoke and mirrors. People have figured that out. And then our profession, so desperate for credibility, 
worried about its title. The head of IT, when I joined the industry, was something called a DP manager, data processing manager. Apparently that wasn't aloof enough. It didn't have enough executive presence. And so that evolved to MIS, manager of information systems. That's kind of classy, you know, now you're a manager. But that wasn't enough because IT wanted to be at the table where the strategic decisions were made, where the senior business and government executives were. And they did a survey apparently, and they discovered the titles for all those people at the table were chiefs. You know, chief executive officer, chief financial officer, chief of human resources. Well, we clearly need to be a chief then if we're going to be invited to that table. So along came chief information officer. And so finally they worked real hard and they got to the table. So now we got chiefs all around the earth. It's about 1995, the chiefs of IT are at the table. We're now about 50 years old as a profession, right? 45, 95, we're at the table, really credible. We've convinced business people now that we don't speak a foreign language, that we actually are interested in what the business does. So we can apply technology to their needs. Thus, we should be called a chief. They are chief information officer. And then about 1995, here's what the chiefs of the world told their business counterparts. You know, we've been really busy the last 50 years, working away, and we've been coding and coding and coding and doing this really good stuff, but we forgot. There's like this new century coming in about <laughs> five years. And because we forgot, the Earth could end. Uh, as we know it, uh, planes will drop from the sky and lights will go out everywhere because we kind of screwed up. We've been coding and we forgot there's a new century coming. And so what I now need from you fellow chiefs is a blank check. Because if you don't, the Earth's future is in your hands. Unless you write me a blank check. 1995 to 2000 was the fastest growth in IT budgets on Earth ever experienced. It ran a clip in excess of 25% a year for five years. COBOL programmers were hired out of retirement. They could charge whatever they wanted per hour to fix the old systems that were built around that technology. And we worked really, really hard to save the Earth. And we had the world so scared, there were multiple days they needed to be scared of. What would happen on 9-9? Nine, nine. Halloween, St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> but then the big one, midnight, December 31st, 1999. I travel a lot. And one of the things I enjoyed during this period was watching different countries' culture react to the possibility of the Earth ending. And it really varied pretty widely. And God bless America. We, we did stand tall. Do you know? that in the IT profession, every CIO of an American-based airline was required to be somewhere up in the air flying an airplane at midnight. Does that not just bring chills up and down your spine? Would John Wayne have been proud or what? There's every CIO on the plane ready to say, if it's bad code, I'm going down with it. <laughs> it's magical. But none of the planes dropped, the lights stayed on, the air still spin, and I hope it had something to do with all the money we spent. No one will ever know. <coughs> that happened. Then what? The internet imploded. No, it didn't. Business stupidity did. I thought it was through imploding, but apparently recent experiences suggest we're not through imploding business stupidity. The business stupidity in the 90s was Let's build a business, put it online on the internet, then go public and make a gazillion dollars. And apparently we're going to do this with something called new math. And one of the parts of the new math formula was the way you calculate the value of a stock on the stock exchange that's running on the internet is you multiply 250 times their earnings that don't yet exist and that will give you a value proposition that of course is brain dead. The internet didn't go belly up. It today represents the biggest platform for IT development anywhere. It's business stupidity that blew up. And then, early 2001, we had an economic blip. 
Suddenly, brakes are put on IT budgets everywhere. And in May of 2003, out comes a Harvard Business Review article authored by a fellow named Nick, jeez, uh, I've forgotten his last name, They're blank, yeah, Nick Carr. And the title of that article was, IT Doesn't Matter. He made the case IT was no different than electricity or railroads. It was silly for CEOs to be looking at it seriously strategically. In fact, he argued there was so much overselling during the 1990s that they ought to just arbitrarily cut IT budgets for the foreseeable future at least 5% a year to get out the fat. The book I did happened to come out about the same time it was pure dumb luck. He and I got presented, positioned as point counterpoint, and we've done a number of debates around the world, which is a lot of fun. Neat guy, like him, good friend, and I agree with a lot of his criticism of the 90s overhype. I disagree with his conclusion. And the reason I do, and that I won all the debates as a result, uh, is because no one can define precisely what IT is going to be in five years. It isn't like electricity or the railroad. And in fact, it's very important business leaders stay on top of where IT is going to make the right business decisions because the impact of the PC has happened. The impact of the network computer isn't done yet. Who knows what's after that? One of the things I am so delighted to see at UNCG and often talk about it publicly is the desire to integrate the IT education experience in the business school. I think that's smart. In fact, I think over time every college should do that. I don't think you can be an adequate CEO today without being competent from a technology perspective. And I don't think anybody ought to get in the IT profession without a real sense of the business that they're supposedly supporting. If you look at the issue of why, since this is so obvious that this is important, why is a company like Microsoft investing resources full time trying to understand this? And why didn't we do it before? Why not before? You know why? Because people bought it anyway. It's the truth. They bought it anyway. They bought, and I'm not ashamed of that. I'm not, uh, I'm not aware that the industry should feel super bad. But why? Because it was new. Yes, a spreadsheet was better than a slide rule. Yes, a word processor is better than a typewriter. And for all of its foibles, yes, electronic mails enhanced our communications capability. But what's different today is as good as all that value may have been, that's the easy stuff. That's, we believe this will end. And when it does, there are going to be a lot fewer competitors. And we're going to try to invest wisely so that when we come out the other end, because it will end, we're going to be prepared to be that much more successful. And we just want to know you as a company are with us. You can imagine what I said. And I said, absolutely, we are with you. And we will do anything to continue to allow you to empower this company with the use of technology and be as flexible as we can to make sure we are not a pain on the cost side. Because when you come out the other end successfully, we want you to remember that we were with you when it was really tough. Centex, you might know, is now about to be acquired by another big organization in the home building industry. They are acquiring that company because they're investing in the land that they own, that they know when this ends, they'll then have ready to go. And the technology to make sure they manage the projects they're building even better because they know they're going to be fewer competitors and they want to take advantage of this opportunity. And that's what Microsoft's doing. We have the good fortune of having some assets. We're going to use them to our advantage against our competitors. And our competitors aren't sitting around either. Who did Oracle just acquire? Sun sucked it out from underneath IBM. It is the business leadership, whether it's in the toughest business in our country today, home building, all the way to a technology company or to a general who says, I am serious about making sure that I empower those warfighters with what they need, so I'm going to figure out what i got to change to make that happen. Those are leaders. They're entrepreneurs. They see this as something that will end. 
and they're going to try to wisely invest in a lot of things, but including technology, to better position themselves to compete. I believe the IT industry today can bring the best value it ever could. And I think that's the reason so many of us who are in are excited about that opportunity. And I hope many of you who are students will look at that in the same way. Whether you enter our industry or you find yourself in a business where I hope you look at technology from whoever you purchase it as something to leverage to your advantage. But don't forget, technology projects that fail to deliver, more often than not, has nothing to do with technology not working like the little bit book said it was supposed to. It has to do with lack of leadership. Thank you very much.